Hey, what is up, Moto Buddies? This is Mike from Taco Moto Co. and Baja Taco Tours. Today I'm going to give you a uh, tour of the 2020 500 EXCF manual, the owner's kit, uh, the tool kit, everything that comes with your bike, or at least should come with your bike. This is a complete set, so we have a really great dealer that we work with, and we make sure that we get all of the components, bags, the little accessory bits that come with the new bike purchase. And so we're just going to run through all of these individual little things, tell you what they are. We're going to go through the manual look at some of the maintenance intervals and some of the tips and tricks that you should be paying attention to if you have a new bike. Now this is specific to this 500, this is the manual for that, but if you have any of the EXC bikes or any of the Husqvarna FE bikes, they're all gonna be the same. This is the street legal bike. Now if you have the off-road bike, which would be the XC, FW, or the FE for the Husky, the FES is the street legal version. Those manuals are just a, a wee bit different because they don't have some of these street conversion things. And like for the rim locks, those are already installed. And on these street bikes, they leave it to the owner to decide if he wants to convert some of these things over to dirt use. So um, let's look at all these goodies over here. We're gonna talk about this cam. This is the throttle cam. Your bike came with a gray one. It's got the gray one installed. This is the more high performance one. We'll take a look at that when we get into the manual, but they give you the black one. These are the fuel filters. These are the inline at the fuel disconnect for the tank, between the tank um, and the bike itself. And you get a couple of new ones. Uh, as it happens, we always just clean these and get many, a couple of years really of use out of these. You can just blow them out, blow the air through these backwards. But they give you two new ones here. Um, these two bolts, gosh, I don't know what these things are. If anybody knows what these two bolts are, put that in the comments below. I've never figured it out. Uh, right here, this is for your rim locks on the street bikes anymore since I think in 19 they stopped. Oh look, here's another one of these hidden in there. That's cool. So they give you three. Okay, so you got three of these fuel filters there. So um, I think it was 19, past 19, they stopped from the factory putting the rim locks in the street legal bikes. And so now if you want to convert your bike over to dirt use, you have the option of doing that. If you are, then you're absolutely going to want to put these in. Because um, if you flat out, your tire will spin on the rim. So this becomes essential. Another thing that is pretty essential is to uh, counterbalance these. And um, you can do that through lead weights, uh, rim weights, Nomar, brass, spoke weights, tons of options. We have a video on um, how to balance your rims. So that's what these things are. Spark plug socket. Now this is a, uh, I think this is a 13 millimeter or a 10 millimeter. Uh, maybe it's 11 and 10, but you can use an Allen wrench. So if you're out in the field, um, the purpose behind this is to be able to use your toolkit, use your factory toolkit, and put that on there and use that to get your spark plug out if you're out in the field. And I know this doesn't fit, but that is an Allen. That's a metric Allen size. And so you could use either one of those methods to remove your spark plug out in the field. And then this thing here, this is a wash kit. When you take your tank off the bike and you're gonna pressure wash your bike, they give you, so this is the inlet, this is the O-ring for the uh, quick disconnect between the tank and then the bike, and that's a replacement O-ring for that. And then this goes over that. This is the, um, again, this would be the male side. Both of these are on the male side of the tank quick disconnect. This is a replacement ring, and then this is the wash cap. And then this goes into the female side on the tank. So you can pressure wash your tank, not get any water or dirt into the tank fittings, both male and female. That's what that kit is right there. Oh, and look, they call it the wash cap set, and that's what it is. And then this is for if you're going to take off. What they, what they basically have in mind is if you're going to take one of the mirrors off. They figure if you're going to go and, and ride dirt, you don't need both mirrors. And so you'll take one off, and then you can cap off the, the threaded um, top perch plate that came on your bike so you could reduce one of the mirrors. This is a bolt that would uh, eliminate the kickstand return cam on the off-road bikes. You don't have that return cam. If you notice when you put your stand up or your bike up, then the kickstand automatically sort of goes back a couple of degrees. That's just a safety feature. You can remove 
the long bolt and the cam and then put this shorter bolt in your kickstand uh, and that gets rid of that feature. This right here is an extra, um, this is an electrical washer. This goes on the grounding frame, so the grounding strap that comes off your battery and goes to the frame, to the aluminum subframe on the KTMs. The Huskies have a, a, a better setup, but on the KTM bikes, it's, a, it's a, a ground strap and it goes to the frame, the subframe. They give you an extra washer because they know that that is kind of a, a weak point. And if you ever have to clean, remove that cable and you lose this little star washer, this just provides electrical bonding between the two. And uh, so they give you an extra one. These are for your, your clutch and um, brake lever. And so if you're gonna take off your stock flags, that's the right here, that's your hand guards, okay? If you're gonna take those off and then convert to like some standard wraparound bark buster, guards then you'll replace the whole uh, setup and and the bolts the bolts that hold these flags on are longer and if you remove those then you just have shorter bolts and they give you those and then if you're going to get rid of your flags you can convert over to um, kind of the off-road setup which doesn't have the flags and then just runs um, no flag on the on the levers and then these are the the little guards that cover those so these are the spare parts that should have come with your bike. If your dealer did not give you all of these items, then go see him. He probably is not trying to steal them from you. He doesn't need all this stuff. He just neglected to do it. Also in your owner's kit, you're gonna have this little hard parts catalog. This thing, it's not a true catalog. It's just sort of a sales link. And they're urging you to go to your dealer, get service from your dealer, and then buy your boots and gear and all your accessory parts from them. Uh, this is a new thing that they've started doing recently. Then they also give you your fork decals if you want to put those on. Some of the dealers will put this on so you won't have it in your kit. These are already on your bike. A uh, little swag kit, some stickers. This is the packing list. This tells you what you should have. You could go through with your dealer if you wanted to and check off and make sure that he gave you every one of these items. These are like the wash cap sets right here, handguard assembly kit, all of this stuff. Now the handguards are installed in your bike. So some of these things, if you're gonna be really OCD about it, some of these are, are installed by the dealer. So this is basically the, the pack list of everything that came out of the crate and then some of the stuff goes in this owner's kit. Some of it goes on your bike. Tool kit right here. Clamp for mirror. That's the thing. So we've already looked at a lot of these. Contact washer. That's an electrical uh, washer. So some of the stuff's already going to be on your bike. Some of it's going to be here in the packet. Uh, apparently they had a misprint on the manual. And so they're going to send us, what is this? I don't know. Missing part will be shipped. So uh, don't care. Uh, this is cool. This is a, a little notepad paper here it's just a engineer graph paper okay and then i think we got a pen somewhere. i've lost it yep got a ktm branded pen and then in your tool pouch very standard a lot of bikes come with a tool pouch these used to be nicer now they're kind of a chinese made set of i guess harbor freight quality tools it's okay no problem really heavy though these items are very very heavy if you ever wanted to upgrade, you could get a nice set of Motion Pro wrenches, titanium wrenches. Uh, like a full set of titanium Motion Pro wrenches is about the same weight as like one of the standard kit wrenches. This one here is your spoke wrench. And then I have no idea what this open side is. That's for adjusting the flux capacitor, I guess. If you know what that is, put that in the comments. So here you've got your, this is your um, axle. So the rear of your bike is 27 millimeter. Nothing on your bike is 32 millimeter. The motocross bikes, their rear axle is 32. Um, and then over here, nothing on your bike is, well, yes, I'm sorry, you do have a 21. This is the size of your rear brake master cylinder cap. That's 21. And 17 is the size of your front um, axle pinch nut. So this is for the take your front wheel off. This is to take the rear wheel off. This for your master cylinder and then they give you a little spoon here that's for uh, tire tire removal you need more than just the one <clears throat> and you could get um, versions of all of these things from motion pro or other guys they come in aluminum and they're super light 
And then you've got your, this is kind of cool. This is my favorite little thing about this kit inside of here. You've got Torx bits. These are quarter inch. They don't make this easy to come apart. You've got Torx bits. These all fit on here. These are not quarter inch. Notice that these are six millimeter Allen, right? Clever. So you can't convert these over or use these with your quarter inch driver. They don't fit. So they give you a couple of Torx. There's a flat blade. And then they give you just some standard eight, six, and 10 millimeter sockets. And again, these are all six millimeter drive. So if you lose any of these, it's kind of a drag. If you lose one, you lose your eight, which is very common. You can't replace that. You can't just go to your toolkit and throw a, a standard quarter inch in there. It won't fit. It kind of does. We, you know, you can probably jam it in there, whatever, but that's not what it's, it's not ideal. So those are the tools that come with your bike. Just a quick aside. Um, I've replaced most of that on my bike with just this motion pro kit. You get a couple of sockets. This, if you haven't seen this, it's worth your time to check it out. You've got all kinds of little adapters and multiple tools. I think there's like 26 different tools in one with this setup. So if you're trying to save weight and conserve space, this could be a pretty good upgrade over all of this. Of course, you'll still need a, uh, um, some pliers and, and a few different things, but you can conserve weight. We have another video coming out that's going to be just about tools, pack tools, service tools, and like tools. So that's that. Now let's spend some time and go through the manual. This is the Bible of your bike. You do well to spend a good amount of time understanding some of the special features and then especially feel, you know, you're going to get out in the field and you're going to have problems and you're going to want to know what, what the solution is. And the book really here, right here, will help you through a lot of that. Very common misunderstanding is what is the difference between the yellow knob on your throttle body and then the red knob up here at the top. The manual goes through that. It talks about what the idle speed is. The Just really quick, the bottom is the yellow knob. That's the cold start knob. When you push that in, not pull it out. So on a lot of motorcycles, to set the choke, you push it in. I'm sorry, you pull it out. On this setup, you push it in. So the fast idle speed knob gets pushed in. When you want to release that, you can either pull that knob out, click it out, or you can move the grip, the throttle grip, backwards, and that will release the little detent there. So that's the fast idle, and that is adjustable. You can turn that to set the speed of the fast idle. And then the red knob at the top is for the standard idle, engine idle. Both of these have adjustment points, and you should experiment on your bike uh, and see what each one of these do and how they work. Okay, over here, this is the little steering lock. This key goes in here. Now, do not be convinced that this is going to keep some crackhead from stealing your bike. If you if you slam your bars hard enough away from the lock position, you'll, you'll be able to break that loose. So um, that's kind of a false sense of security. And if your bike ever has weird steering issues, then this mechanism may have malfunction. We've seen that. So I usually tell guys, do not use that. Do not rely on that. And, and, and don't ever... Um, the more you use that, the more likelihood that you're going to have some sort of like steering stem issue. So my recommendation is don't ever use that. If you need to secure your bike, there's better ways than that. Um, okay, so over here, this is engine break-in. So this, this right here is the only section where they really tell you how to like break in your bike, your new engine. And they basically just want you to run at minimal, not minimal, but just to put a ceiling on your... Um, RPM, so don't go above 7,000 for the first uh, during the run-in phase. And they really don't even tell you what the run-in phase. I think the idea behind this is they want the dealer to to break, uh, to talk to you about what the break-in um, cycle is in your bike, and they tell you to do that for three hours. So what they what they really kind of well, let's jump over here and see if in the service schedule. We'll get to that in a minute. Let me tell you how I run my my bikes, how I break them in. I break them in pretty aggressively. I ride them hard immediately. I don't baby them. The beauty of these modern motorcycles, the metallurgy is so tremendous and advanced. Back in the day when we had um, engines with steel liners, you had to seat the steel rings against the steel liner, and those two things were very hard, and they took a long time to break in. And nowadays, we have nicosyl plating on our aluminum cylinder 
um, on our jugs on these bikes and they will seat pretty rapidly with the rings and so long extended break-in times are no longer necessary that's just sort of uh, you, you know our grandpas used to have to do that so when I get a new bike or a new engine or a rebuild um, I will run it fairly aggressively right away straight away change the break-in oil after one hour and then um, something I learned from uh, Slavin's video just the other day, he will drain that first charge of uh, that first crankcase of break-in oil and then run a second crankcase of break-in oil. And that's very clever. And so I'm going to start doing that now. And your second um, crankcase of break-in oil, KTM doesn't sell, nobody really sells anything called break-in oil that I'm aware of. If you know of something, put it in the comments. But what I just use as break-in oil is any standard, and it could be a multi-weight, but I like a single weight. I use Castrol. I use Castrol single weight, their cheapest brand of oil. This would be like gas station oil, Pet Boys oil, like a, like a generic gas station branded oil. You know, it could be like the, the Pet Boys branded oil, just any low-cost oil standard. I usually get a 30 weight. And that's what I use as a break-in oil. It's a straight petroleum. There's nothing fancy. There's no fancy uh, additive package in there. And that's, that's what I use. So I'm going to start using two cycles at one hour each of break-in oil. Running the bike, I, I, I want to be cautious. I don't redline it. I don't hit the dunes and then put max load. I don't bog it. And so I'm, I'm fairly conscientious of how I run the engine for like that first two hours now with the with these two oil changes but after that after that second cycle then it's full scent and i'm going to change that oil out with something that is um, now high grade and that's the engine oil that i'm going to run for the duration of the motor and i'll use something you know if you want the best oil there's so many debates about this but the best oil is really the mot modal motul v uh, 300 300 v oil that's pretty much the best oil you're going to get uh, there any other Jasso 2, and we'll we'll talk about that in a second when we get to that page, but a Jasso 2 rated engine oil, motorcycle oil, is sufficient. And let's talk about that when we get to that point. So, and they say avoid opening the throttle fully. I ignore that completely. So that's how I break in a new engine. And you can leave comments. There's so many different arguments about, about all that. Okay, so they talk about... Uh, this is funny. So they basically say if you're going to ride this motorcycle in anything that's that's difficult. So here, riding in dry sand, riding in wet sand, uh, riding in mud, riding in snow. They basically want you to change out the sprockets to steel because your bike comes with a uh, an aluminum sprocket, which is going to wear out really quickly if you do any kind of rough service riding on it. So they're they're basically saying this is a nice little feature. They've got this. Um, these are, yeah, raincoat. So Twin Air makes sort of like a, uh, what do you call that? That's We use P3 Racing filter skins on all of our filters. This is sort of their version. It's it's like a hairnet. It's a fine mesh. They're, they're kind of cool looking. It's a fine mesh air filter cover, and it's a pre-filter. And so this is the one they recommend for sand. This one here is dry, and it is just sort of like a second, a second thin filter that goes over the top one, and they call it the... Um, yeah, this one here's here the dust cover, and this one's the raincoat. They're they're basically just like a very thin. Sh it's shaped just like the filter, and you s you put it over the top of your standard oil filter, and you don't oil these. And all three of these are just essentially pre filters. Again, I just run P3 Racing filter skins over the top of all of my filters for all of these these reasons. Um, they just want you to basically get rid of those aluminum. Um, sprockets and then change them out to steel. So that's that's kind of what's going on there. A lot of this stuff I'm not going to go into depth because this is standard to any motorcycle. And, and if you've never had a motorcycle before, then you should spend time reading this and understanding this. If you have had bikes in the past, all of this, so much of this, is exactly the same to any motorcycle. So here's your maintenance chart here. And a couple of things I think are worth noting. Um, you have this heim joint which is on the back of your shock. This is on the lower part of your shock. And on KTMs, unfortunately, how they come is you cannot grease the heim joint or the swing arm bearings um, at, the, at the frame. And that is kind of a 
kind of a bummer. A lot of the other motorcycle brands give you a grease fitting there, and KTM does not. So one nice upgrade to do on a brand new bike is to replace the Heim joint bolt and the swing arm shaft with greasable versions of the same items. And, and we have those on the store, and they're very cool, and that's something that I do to, to new bikes as just one of the, you know, when you get a brand new bike, there's a handful of things you should do and mod and, and ensure straight away. And that's one of the things we always do is we change the Heim joint bolt and then the swing arm uh, to shaft to greasable type and consider that. Uh, they want you to check the wheel bearing play. You should always be doing that pretty much on every ride. You just grab the back wheel and rock it back and forth and it's either clunking or it's tight and that's how you check that. They want you to check the steering head bearing play, and in a minute we'll talk about what that preload is. And um, something too here, if you see these hours, these are basically, you could just round up to 500 miles. So if you look at this, everything is 500 miles apart. So 500, 1,000, and 1,500. So I'm rounding up, but I think it's kind of annoying that these are 465. They're really doing it off rounded numbers on the kilometers. So I always look at this chart and I just round these up, 500, 1,000, and 1,500. And so they want you to check that every 500 miles. And then on the valve clearance, let's talk about that for a minute. So valve clearance, they want you to look at it, uh, inspect it at 30 miles. Okay, so let's round up to 50. So at 50 miles, they want you to do a valve check. I neglect to do that basically on every bike. I don't think I check my valves on any bike until about the first probably 100 hours, maybe 150 hours. Here in the book, they would tell you that's a 1,000 miles. Uh, so on my bikes, I do everything off hours. I don't do anything on miles. I don't spend a lot of time on the road. All of my bike, uh, my bikes are seeing off-road use. Um, and so it's your discretion whether or not you run your service maintenance schedule on hours or miles. It's preference. Uh, I do hours. And so I do my first valve check probably at 100 hours and then I'll do it maybe up to 200 hours thereafter. So I'm doing every valve check at 200 hours. What that works out to be to miles, I have no idea. I would probably recommend about 2,000 miles. Now see, something too to, to mention here, this is a race schedule. This bike is a race bike. And so they're considering full race use and they have been extremely conservative on all of these. So conservative, look here, at 4,000 miles, they're going to rebuild the motor, full rebuild, replace the piston. Um, it, it's, you go through these items and, and you're doing a full engine rebuild. I never have replaced uh, these components or, or rebuilt an engine at 4,000 miles. You can go much longer than that. We've got guys out there who are getting six, seven, eight hundred hours out of a out of a top end, let alone a bottom end. My typical um, time on a bottom end is about 1,500 hours. That is to say, like, I'll just, once a bike hits 1,500 hours, I will do a bottom end um, because it's pretty much time. I would say on a top end, I'm probably doing them at about 600 hours. So 600 hours when a bike hits hits that, that's about, and if it's, if the compression is good, it's not burning oil and it's running fine with plenty of power, uh, I'm not going to change it based on an arbitrary number. I'll change it based on what the leak down test data tells me until I get to about 600, and then I'm gonna do it, and a bottom end, about uh, 1500, I think is what I said, and that's when I'm automatically gonna do those things. So that's the information, as far as I'm concerned, on the valve clearance. Change oil and filter, here they're having you do it every 500 miles. Um, I know of guys who are overlanders like Paul Stewart, RTW Paul, he's probably doing his oil about every 2,000 miles. Now, that's probably with short shifting and he's overlanding with lots of constant throttle and constant RPM. And so <clears throat> you can extend the service life of your oil based on how um, you ride the bike. If I'm <clears throat> racing a motor, then I'm okay with probably doing it every 500 miles, and that probably ends up being about 15 hours, maybe 20 hours. So if you're a hard rider, aggressive, and hard conditions, and you'll have to determine who you are and what those are, it's probably advisable that you're changing oil every 10 hours, maybe 15 hours. If you're more of a um, casual rider, an overland rider, and you don't 
beat the hell out of your engine, then you're probably able to extend that up to 25 hours, 30 hours. I, I have no problem going 30, maybe even 40 hours. That could be ridiculous. Uh, but, but I have probably have no problem. Now, let me say this. Let's talk about oil really quick. Here's a huge debate that happens all the time. I am not a fan in your expensive Austrian motorcycle of running a low quality um, off brand oil. And that would be anything that is not a, um, first of all, MA rating. What is MA rating? That is um, JASO, the, a Japanese engineering firm, has come up with a rating called MA. You can research that. I won't go into that here. There's, I've got articles where I talk about that, and, and there's plenty of Google that. So running a um, Rotella, a lot of guys run Rotella on their bikes. Uh, Rotella is not MA certified. It is not a JASO approved oil. On the bottle, they say that it is JASO MA2 rated. It is not. You can email JASO. Uh, you can look at the JASO approval list that they publish. All of this stuff is the internet uh -huh, is beautiful. It's a research tool. All of this stuff you can find out. Uh, you can call Shell. You can send them an email. And they will tell you that Rotella is not MA certified. It has not run through the process. They claim it's MA certified because they've self, they have self—they themselves believe it meets the standards of the MA. However, it is not a true MA oil. So if, if, if you need your bottle of oil to be MA rated, and this is the MA rating, and this is the MA certificate. So this is a bottle of Spectro, Spectro oil right here. I personally run this on, on all my bikes. Um, and so if you pull, if you look at the back of any bottle of oil that claims to be MA rated, and it does not have this JASO number right here, which you can look up, you can, you can look all these numbers up, and this will prove to you whether it's a true MA rated oil or not. Rotella does not have this. It is not MA rated. Um, this happens to be. So if that is important to you, if maintaining factory spec and warranty spec is important, then it's got to be a real MA rated oil, not a uh, fake oil, not pretend, not where the manufacturer just says, oh, we, you know, it's our determination, it's our judgment that it meets a specific certification. It either is or it isn't. And Rotel is not MA certified. Um, the other thing I would say about using um, a, an oil, here's a, here's a dyno trick. Let me let you in on a secret. If I'm running a bike on a dyno, and I want the numbers to be weaker. I want to artificially throw the numbers lower than what that motor is really producing. Then I'll run a low-grade oil. So I'll put Rotella. It's, it's, it's a secret. It's a dyno trick. Fill a crankcase up with Rotella, and you will lose, uh, probably on a single-cylinder motor like this, two to three horsepower. Um, maybe a little bit less, two, between two and three. There's conditions dependent. So you're going to lose horsepower from your motor running an oil that does not meet or does not have good flow rate characteristics. And so, you know, if you think about the passages, the oil passages on a motorcycle, they're incredibly small. Um, on a semi-truck, which is what that oil is designed for, those oil passages are as big as a, a dime, a nickel sometimes. Our oil passages are small. Their little quarter-inch things are less. And so flow rates are very different between these two applications. So um, let me just finish up by saying run the best oil that you can. Spend the money. Extend the service life also. I have no problem if you're running um, a Spectro oil or Motor X or Modal oil and you want to take these, these um, recommendations that I've just given and push them up a little bit. I'm totally fine with that. One of the reasons why some of these guys with high mileage bikes get those kind of miles is they run a good oil and they change them based on what their judgment says the use of their bike is. So there's my piece on engine oil. And then um, as far as the, we'll talk about screens in a minute. You've got three filters. Well, technically it's two, it's one filter and two screens. We'll cover that later when we get to that in the chapter. None of, none of this is specific to KTMs really. It's general motorcycle stuff. They talk about servicing the fork every, um, again, I'm going to round that up, every 1,500 miles and shock and fork oil. I, I would recommend changing the shock oil. See here, the shock oil and the fork oil are the same. 
I cut the shock oil in half. I do the shock oil twice as often as the fork oil. That's because there's less oil. The shock does twice the work because there's only one versus two on the forks. And then that, that shock is exposed to huge heat loads because of the, the exhaust transiting directly by it, a quarter inch or so away from the shock. So I, I increase the service interval on the shock over the forks. Changing the fuel screen, that is this little thing right here. That's the fuel screen. They recommend changing it, and I do too. Uh, I blow these out every oil change. I replace them probably about every two years. I don't, I don't really track miles. I just sort of, I have these, these intervals that once, once I get to one year, two year, four year, I will do certain things. And this is about a two year item as far as I'm concerned, blowing it out every time. Um, and then check the inlet membrane. What the hell is that? I think that is this. And maybe the fuel screen. Well, page 136, we'll get to that. So the other thing too is the, to talk about on the fuel system, is the, the uh, fuel filter inside of the tank. When you look down in a flashlight into your, into your gas tank, you'll see that there's a, there's a filter inside your gas tank. That's your in-tank filter. I changed that at about 60 hours on the first filter. So brand new bike, 60 hours. And then I change it probably about 150 hours, maybe 200 hours every time after. And um, there'll be a lot of black debris when you change it. There'll be black debris that comes out of that. That is not road dirt. That's carbon from the brushes of the of the fuel filter. That's what that is. And um, and so the most carbon that you're going to get out of that filter is when the filter or when the pump is brand new and it, the 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 brushes are seating against the um, armature in the motor, and that's going to shed the most. And that's that first the the first filter change is going to have the most that you'll see ever really and um, that's what that black stuff is okay so there you go on fuel filters they also say that they want you to check the fuel pressure and i recommend that too um, and they want you to do that every 500 miles and that will give you a good indication of what's going on as far as your fuel system is going and the health of your fuel pump and we have a, a, a fuel pressure tester gauge that you could you could grab and that will show you what your pressure is and i do that too i i routinely check the fuel pressures on bikes and in fact when i get somebody who's got a drivability problem with their engine and uh, one of the very first things i need to know is what is your fuel pressure because that will affect so many uh parameters on how the engine drive engine engine runs and uh, the performance characteristics are are based on fuel pressure and pressure should be about 48 to 51. that's what your fuel pressure should be and it should not fall when you when you rev out the motor there I won't explain all of these troubleshooting tips but that's what you need okay continuing on they talk about cleaning out the spark arrestor and so we'll look at uh, we'll look at that here in a second uh, servicing the fork they, they cover that above uh, changing the fuel filter. Oh, I guess, you know, that's the in-tank. There it is. That's the in-tank fuel filter, and they want you to do that every 4,000 miles. So we kind of already talked about that. And then, look at this, at 4,000 miles, they want you to rebuild the motor. We've covered that. Okay. Um, now, lots of guys have lots of confusion about how to set up your suspension system, and the book does a very good job of walking you through that. The first thing they tell you is that the stock springs, the standard springs, are for a 165 to 187 pound rider. If you're over that, you need to change your springs. If you're under that, change your springs. This is the stock bike is set up for that weight of a rider, and so take that into account. They also tell you that depending on how you want your uh, suspension to feel, they give you the clicker settings. Read through this stuff. Really informative, really helpful. They also talk about sag, and then they give you spring so on the springs in the rear for setting up the sag, they give you all this information. It's all here, all the specs. And as far as setting these things up, there's so many good YouTube videos on how to do this stuff. The manual gives you sort of a brief overview, like a 10,000 foot view of how to do that. And that, that's all good. But um, if you, a lot of guys who have never done this before, this is not sufficient to answer all the questions and help you out as much as <clears throat> like a good YouTube video it would. So there's plenty of good ones out there. Check some of those out. 
And then if you're overweight on your spring, um, they will tell you, so you can go up to 209, 187, and 209 pounds. They'll tell you what the, um, what the spring rates would be to upgrading your springs. If you have any questions, let me just say this. This is voodoo science to a lot of guys, and I totally understand. Some of this stuff, though, any rider can and should do. Every rider should understand what his clicker's settings are and adjust those accordingly. Every rider should set his sag. If you don't know how to do these things, get a buddy who's more experienced at this stuff than you are to help you out and walk you through this. As far as spring rates go, that's where it gets a little touchy and a little more complicated. So if you're over or under the spring rate of your bike, get a hold of us and, and I can walk you through what spring changes you need to make so that you fall within that. And this rider weight right here, you have to take into account that this weight needs to include you with your gear, with your backpack, with the standard tools that you bring, with water in your, in your camel back, um, if you're running bags on your bike, saddle bags, all of the accessory weight, that includes what you put on your body on the motorcycle, that needs to be added into this, this number here. So your stock spring in the rear is this middle one, the 165 to 187. If you start adding weight to that bike and you push above, then it's time to respring, especially in the back. And they only give you one additional column here for additional springs, but really we can, we can, there's probably seven or eight more uh, additional springs that would be in this chart if this was a full chart. So anyway, if you have questions about this, get a hold of us and, and we can help you out. But the book's very good at, at breaking all this down. Um, here it talks about, well, that was for the shock, okay? So this first section is for setting up the clickers and the rear end. The second section is for tuning up the front end. And again, they give you the clicker settings here for the forks and your dampening and compression, uh, or your rebound and compression. The, the, they're on each side. The book will explain. One is white, one is red. It will walk you through that. It will also walk you through the preload, which is this outer ring on the right-hand side. And here it is, so adjusting the, sport, the, the spring preload, and they walk you through that. So this stuff is not secret, it's just in the book. you got to read it. So another thing that is um, a big surprise to a lot of guys on a KTM, and this is very trick. On the front triple clamp, they give you two bolts. Okay, so there's two positions. Obviously, the closer one will push the bars, bring it in closer to you away. But then, as far as the bar risers go, it is, it's offset. So there's an offset angle and you can move the bars, push the bars out even a little further. And you notice in this diagram, they give you this little arrow sign indicating that you can take this, the riser, and flip it around. And all of the instructions here will kind of walk you through that. But, but the idea is basically, if you have long arms and you want to push the bars out as far as they'll go, make sure that you're in the forward bolt and make sure that you flip this around and so the offset is to the front. See how how the machining of this, if you, maybe I need to get closer here, but you can see the machining has the, the two bolts here. You get a, a more generous offset here on one side than the other. And so you can flip that around. So there's ways of tuning your cockpit uh -huh, I said cockpit, to give yourself more room if you're a taller rider or have longer arms. Very cool. It's a kind of a unique thing that KTM does. Obviously, there's aftermarket versions of all of this. There's aftermarket top tri triples. There's aftermarket bar risers. There's bar extenders. So you can get very tricky with setups if you want to go that route. If you want to stay stock, they do give you some nice adjustments here. Okay... Um, they also tell you that you should bleed the air out of the top of your, your forks, and they explain how to do that. There are some nice aftermarket threaded fork bleeders that, that go into these slots here, these little holes, these ports, to bleed the air out of your forks. Um, you can research and see why you might want to be bleeding your, your air out every ride, even during your rides. And then these aftermarket, uh, Warp 9 makes a good one that I like and run on a lot of my bikes. Uh, for that job. Okay. They also talk about fork seals. You have the outer fork seal and the inner one. The inner fork seal you can't see because it's up here. It's it's right here. It is in this section to this section is where the inner fork seal is. That's the true oil seal. All the outer one is just a it's a, a pre-wiper. It just is wiping off the dust 
as best as possible before it gets up into the real oil seal. So if your forks are dripping oil, if oil is running down your fork legs, then the inner seal has a problem. And there's ways you can service that out in the field, especially if you have the right tools. And there's a really cool uh, seal doctor is a little tool that I carry on all my bikes. And that lets me clean that while I'm out on the trail. And I recommend those. You can get those uh, from us or anywhere else. And um, how to use that, you'll have to research that later. But that's that's a really great thing to do on the trail if you need to. So they, they kind of break that down for you. Cleaning the dust boots on the fork legs. Also, one other thing, uh, Acherbees makes a fork gaiter that covers the exposed chrome tubes uh, to keep dust off of the, the chrome legs here and then avoid dirt going up and fouling your seals. Also, SKF makes a seal wiper it's a mud scraper and so there's there's nice aftermarket solutions to leak pr to prevent leaking fork seals that all work really good i always recommend those uh, when you're setting up a new bike um we already talked about bleeding out the air i'm skipping pages i'm not going page by page here i've got these tabs here and we're skipping quite a few Let's see, what do we do in here? This talks about the steering stem. Okay, so the preload in the, um, in the uh, bearings, adjusting the steering head bearing play. They give you two different, the six days and the standard. So here's the six days and that the preload is different between the two. They have more, there's more preload on the six days than there is on the standard chassis because the idea is, is that the six-day bike is more of a high-performance machine versus the standard model. And so they give you two different preloads. Preload in the steering stem bearings is a little bit like a poor man's steering stabilizer. So if you, t if you have a little more preload, if your bearing, if the compression of the bearing in your steering stem is tighter, that will restrict or bind the the play the free play of the of the treble clamp of the steering left to right and the more difficult it is to turn that then the less jittery your front end will be and so by adding a little bit of preload you can sort of tame down front end jitters i'm not talking about steering head shake or bar slap that that's an extreme condition but just general trail uh the twitchiness of the front end can be minimized by tightening down the preload, and the, the book will walk you through how to do that. And so I always do that on any new bike. I'll pull the steering stem, or I'll, I'll, I'll follow this procedure here, and nut number three is where you set the preload. And I will, I will increase and add a little bit more preload on the front end. You also, the book, again, it's going to tell you, you have to loosen the pinch clamp bolts and then do number three. So loosen one, two, and then tighten three. Here's how to do that. Now they also talked about in the service interval changing out, well not changing, but cleaning the spark arrestor screen. And so this is fascinating. It's amazing that they've included this now in the 20 models uh, of the manual here. They're showing you a cutaway of the stock can. And a lot of times guys will talk about the resonator. I've talked about the resonator. We've got this in videos. That is the resonator right there. What this thing does is this, this enhances the acoustical characteristics of the muffler, which is part of the dynamics of performance. And so the stock can comes with this resonator. It's essentially shaped the way it is for acoustical performance. This is by design. The exact shape of this is engineered to be like that. And so if you... All right, so let's, there's a lot going on in here. You've got the packing. This is the fiberglass packing. It's rock wool fiberglass. It's even got packing down here in the end. And then this is the, this is the tip. So this section right here is this over here. This is the resonator. You can see this if you, uh, well, you, if you ever remove this, the end cap, or if you have your mouth off and you look this way, you'll see that there's this little cone. You're gonna visually see this profile coming at you of like a cone and it's on both sides this is the end cap this is the spark arrestor and then this is this is the um, end plug and so you can see th how 
restrictive this is on a stock bike, the exhaust gas as it's traveling through needs to sort of present itself around this bung here on the end and then get into the screen and out the end. This is a 27 millimeter outlet port here. And I forget, I have another video that breaks all this stuff down, but this ID right here is 43. This little guy is whatever it is, but it presents a percentage of blockage to the exhaust flow coming out. And then the end cap here with its opening is a percentage of blockage. And so all of these things are restricting your bike. And they, they have to do that because there's sound restrictions. And then this bike has emissions restrictions. And so it has, it is lean, it has a lean fuel profile. And because the motor, it's a 500 cc, well, you have this on the 450 and the 350, the other ones too, they're just sized commensurate to the bike. Because it has a lean fuel scheme, it needs to have a restrictive exhaust system to account for that. And so if you change, here's, this is the classic thing, a guy will throw in a pipe, a guy will knock some of the stuff out, he'll take this little bung out, he'll, there's also a perf screen, this little cheese grater screen at the end of here. Guys will start modding this stuff out. That changes your fueling profile and you have to account for that or your bike, your, your existing lean bike goes even more lean, dangerously lean. The TPS hack is not a tune, that's garbage, don't do that. Um, you need, you need to remedy your fuel. If you have an older bike, you can have the ECU reflashed. Chris Blaze does a great job of doing a wonderful um, reflash on stock ECUs if you have something in that other than the US EPA map. Uh, unfortunately, KTM has updated their dealer service tool. The, the XC1 tool used to allow for out of VIN uh, flashes, and so you could get something called the Euro map. And then with that map, that was like the unlocked map. That was with that unlocked map, then Chris could go in and could reflash with a really nice custom map. But you have to have that unlocked or jailbroken ECU for him to be able to do that. Since KTM has upgraded the dealer tool, now the XC2 tool does not let a dealer flash your ECU with anything other than a, a map that is that is correlated to your VIN. So if you have a US VIN number and he punches that in, then you are going to get the US EPA map. There is no there's no back door. There's no out of out of VIN, out of compliance mapping. So if you have a 17 plus bike and it has the US EPA map, then you're stuck. You cannot reflash your ECU. You that the map is what you've got. Your your ECU is is locked. So to fuel, you want to mod any of this or put on a pipe, then you're going to need to increase your fueling. And you can do that through a JD tuner, a JD piggyback tuner, which is a fantastic solution. It's low cost and it will fuel your bike correctly. Or you could get more exotic with a, a race ECU, and that would be a Vortex or a Get. And we can help you think through and pre-plan all of this. I always tell guys, you, you make a change, you get a change, and it may or may not be the change you're after, and it may or may not hurt your engine. So guys will just read the interwebs, and internet mechanics and forum jockeys will throw out all these solutions and all these suggestions and comments, and they are probably hurting you, hurting your bike, that is to say. And if anything, they're giving you a performance characteristic that you did not pre-plan. You know, in life, we do so many things where we we think through and we pre-plan and, and we put a lot of care and due diligence into making, you know, important choices with a lot of um, the areas of our life. But then guys will just go on the internet and they'll do anything that anybody says in a forum to modify their bike. And so for whatever reason, we sort of just lose our judgment and our common sense when, when it comes to some of these things. So please let, let me know if you've got questions about this stuff or if you want tuning advice because every you make, you make one change to any of this and there's a downstream cascade effect where other things are affected, performance is affected, and it may or may not be the performance direction that you want to go. So watching YouTube videos, including this one, including this one, second guess everything. So many of us are saying things that are nonsense out there on videos and in, in chats and forums. And just just make sure that you you put your due diligence into the choices that you make as far as tuning uh, tuning tuning options. Okay, so resonator, 
leaving it in benefits and improves low to mid-range performance. There's also a huge sound effect that happens when you remove this. You will make your, your pipe a ton louder if you don't care and you want. So who should leave this in? Guys who uh, need sound dampening, the sound is important to them, or guys who want to preserve their low to mid-range throttle response, leave that in. If you want wide open power, super, super moto guys, um, flat track guys, uh, high speed guys, and, and you want full mid to top end power, take that out. Or just remove the whole thing and go to something like a nice FMF or an Acro or some other aftermarket pipe. So this will change sound and will change performance. Removing this will dramatically change your performance, huge. And um, I've got another video that kind of breaks this down. So let's just move on from that for now. The other thing to talk about here is the, the baffling or the fiberglass packing in here. This will deteriorate. It'll break down. It, it basically doesn't decompose, but it just vibrates. These are glass fibers, and they vibrate against each other, and then they, they break, and then they go out the exhaust stream. And so guys will pull this apart, and they'll get ready to change it, and they'll notice that there's like... I've seen pipes that it almost has no packing in here. With the in the zone of uh, contact with the perf perf pipe coming through here, within like a, I don't know half inch, quarter inch, whatever. There's like no fiberglass because it's vibrated and fallen out the holes and it's it's gone out the end. This should be replaced, and this also has a major impact on power. Sound and power are affected by this. So I replace this every five years, every bike. I don't I don't keep and maybe I should. You know, some guys do a better job of this than I do, and they'll keep a chart, a spreadsheet, and they'll show that they've changed a thing or done a thing at a certain hours. I have too many bikes, and I'm too lazy, honestly. And so I do track years. And so, again, every five years, every bike, I just pull the mufflers, and then I repack the muffler fiberglass. And you can get this uh, from lots of different sources, uh, but this is an important and super overlooked item on, on older bikes. Um, I think I'm going to stop talking about that. If you have any questions, again, if you have any questions, you can let me know in the comments or you can send us an email. All right. Uh, what are we talking about over here? I think this is just letting you know that they're, yeah, over time, see here, it's talking about that. Over time, the fibers in the glass fiber yarn escape and the dampener burns out and that's the fiberglass packing. Not only is the noise level higher, but performance characteristic change. Okay, um, this is fuel tank, talking about that. This is your connector. Remember earlier we talked about these plugs? One of these plugs goes over the male side on the bike, if you're gonna wash it, and then this is the one that plugs into the female side. A lot of guys will reassemble this, they'll click this together. This is on the bottom of the gas tank, here's on the left side of the engine. They'll click this together. Well, they'll think it's clicked, but it's not and their bike will not run, or their bike will run badly because a minimized amount of fuel pressure, fuel flow is coming through this connector. And so I always recommend put a little engine oil or grease or some sort of lube on that O-ring. And that was that little red O-ring that we saw earlier. That's this O-ring here. And uh, put a little grease or something on that when you click that back together. If you remove your tank, make sure that's reconnected correctly, properly. Okay. Chain, chain adjustment. So many guys have their chain adjustment wrong. So many guys, internet mechanics will say, you just put two fingers in here. They tell you to adjust it um, up here. So this is the chain slider, here's your swing arm, here's the chain slider. Basically what the book is telling you is you have 55 to 58 millimeters of slack with the swing arm down. So the bike is up in the air, and so this, the swing arm is fully extended, and they want 55 to 58 millimeters. You could be super clever and get yourself a bolt or a piece of wood or a 3D print something or something that is 55. Why don't you split the difference and go 56 and a half? And you just keep that with you in your, in your backpack, and then whenever you need to change or want to change or want to check, your chain tension, then you just slip that in there and, and adjust it like that. That's what I do. Um, you would do well to err on the side of your chain being loose rather than tight. 
research that if you have any further questions. When you have a new bike, it is a really good idea to take, this is the axle, this is the adjustment bolt back here. It's a very good idea to turn that bolt out, remove it, and then put some lock, not Loctite, um, anti-seize, some graphite infused, copper infused anti-seize grease on this bolt and then spin it back in. That's a steel bolt and aluminum body of the swing arm and the electrolysis effect uh, because of the dissimilar metals often will cause that to lock up and freeze and become welded inside of there. And, and I've fixed a lot of guys' bikes where we have to drill that bolt out and replace it, and it's a nightmare and expensive and time-consuming. So prevent that problem from happening to you. Just put some anti-seize on that bolt when your bike is brand new. Um, let's see, where else are we going here? I'm going to skip some of this stuff because it's not really specific to KTM. Here's something that is. You have free play here on your on your rear brake pedal and they want you to have three to five millimeter. Sometimes guys will have this so tight that as soon as they use the rear brake a few times and the brake fluid expands, they don't have enough free play here and then the rear brake locks up and the solution is nut number two, bolt three and nut number two. That's where you change and adjust your pedal free play. I like five because I use my rear brake a ton and heat up my fluid a lot. And so I need the most amount of free play so I don't lock up my rear wheel. Also, nut two can fall off. So I use Loctite on two. Three is where you adjust the free play. Very important. Front wheel. A lot of guys do this wrong. Follow the book. There is a great video. Kyle Brotherson on the Dirt Bike channel has the best video that I've seen on how to install your front wheel and to do it correctly on a KTM. Super important, you need to learn that. Here is the little, number eight is that washer that we talked about earlier, no, number A, letter A. A is that washer, this little guy that we looked at earlier. You have one of those, you have that washer on your battery and you also have it on the subframe really important to check. You should know about that. You should know about uh, making sure that your subframe grounding is always good. Okay, starter. If your bike won't start, this is the starter solenoid. This is on top of your battery. Here it is right here, right next to your fuses. So here's, here's the top of your battery. Here's that starter solenoid, and then here's your fuse block. I would recommend strongly recommend that you photocopy these, this page right here. In fact, both, both of these, well, not, just this one. What page is this in the manual? It's 120. Here's my pro tip. Photocopy, page 120, laminate it, do something with it, put it in a Ziploc bag and keep it on your bike. If you ever have a trail side problem where some, some electrical system doesn't work, and you don't know why, and you pop open this fuse box cover here, it's just gonna tell you the fuse number. It doesn't tell you anywhere in your bike. There's nowhere on your bike where it tells you what the fuse pinouts are. And so, at a minimum, just have this, okay? If you're not gonna do anything else, write this down, take a, take a photograph of this out of, out of your manual. You need to know what your fuse pinouts are. And I keep, I recommend that you just photocopy this whole thing and keep it on your bike. What's important here to know is if your bike won't start or if you have other electrical problems, you on the starter relay, you have a fuse. In fact, there's two fuses, but one of them is a spare. So fuse number four is your spare. So the left-hand side, looking at the bottom, the left-hand side fuse number four is a spare fuse. Three is the live fuse. If your bike won't crank, it's... The first thing to check is fuse number three on the starter relay, which is right here in front of your battery. And then if it's bad, then you've got fuse number four. You have two different size fuses on your bike, and so if you're going to carry spares, you need to carry both sides. This is the standard larger automotive size fuse here on the relay, and then down here uh, on your circuit, on your block, these are the micro fuses. So you need to carry, at a minimum, a couple of 20s, large size, and then various sizes down here on the on the small, and then you have a spare fuse, one of these, I think both of these really, yeah, on, on your block here, the two top fuses are spare, the bottom ones are live. So you have three spare fuses in your bike in total of two different sizes. 
understand page 120, familiarize yourself with it. You'll save yourself a huge amount of hassle and headache. Also, uh, Kyle Brotherson has a great video where he got stranded out uh, on the five miles of hell ride in Utah with a bad fuse, thinking it was many, many other possible things and it ended up being a bad fuse. And they did due diligence. I mean, they did, they did it right because they, they removed their fuses and they visually looked at them. And unfortunately, that was not good enough because the fuse did not visually seem to be bad. Um, so when in doubt, have a test tool, have a test light, or what I recommend to guys is just take a f swap each fuse with your spare going through sequentially and make sure that you've put a known good fuse out of your spare into each slot checking that circuit because not all of us understand electrical systems or how to test them. And so if that's you, then just uh, uh, the, the dummy proof way is to put a new fuse into the suspected circuit and see if the condition changes. Everybody should familiarize yourself with this in the shop before you go out on the trail. Uh, speedos. Uh, a lot of guys will have, I think it's RO3. They'll have code RO3 on the Speedo display unit. That's bad battery. That's something that'll happen to guys. Remember that cam we talked about earlier? Your bike comes with the gray cam pre-installed. They give you the black one. This is more high performance. It's funny how they describe this as the adjusting the characteristic map of the throttle response. They use the word map. Don't don't misunderstand. If you change this out, you're not changing the map. The map is commonly referred to or understood to be the, you know, the electronic database or the um, the 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 lookup table for fuel and ignition. This does neither of those. All this does is it changes how aggressively. There's a little uh, angled cam in here. How aggressively uh, this pulls on the 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 throttle cable. The gray one is mild. The black one is aggressive. Changing that will have a dramatic impact on performance, so you could experiment with that. Also, gearing will have a dramatic impact on performance. Those two things alone might be all you need to do to pep up your bike, for a lot of guys. Another thing, too, here is the idle speed. It should be set uh, 1,800 to 1,900 RPM. It's typically, guys will turn down their throttle. Most bikes, the idle speed is too low. And that will cause you starting problems, and it will also cause you to cough and stall. And so a lot of guys who complain about the cough and stall problem, they're trying to fix it with, uh, you know, voodoo products. So there's plenty of guys on the internet who will sell you uh, what, what claim to be solutions to the cough and stall problem. And they come with voodoo promises. But what will actually fix that for a ton of guys for... Uh, for nothing, is just to make sure that you have your idle speed set correctly. So I'm going to say, but I'm going to make up a number, 75% of the guys who are trying to fix and chase cough and stall flame out problems on their bikes, most of those guys, their problem is that their idle speed is too low. Okay. Here is a picture of that quick disconnect, and here you can see the little cone filter, this guy, this thing is right here at number two. And then that's the quick disconnect. There's a little lever right here to release that. That's what I was talking about earlier. If you ever have your tank off, make sure that you click that when you reassemble that these two things go together. Engine oil. Engine, the book will tell you to check the oil when it's hot and it should fall between the A, it will. This circle here is the safe zone. And so basically they want you to have the oil be no lower than the A mark, no higher. They don't. They don't give a C mark here, but no higher than the top, no lower than the bottom, and ideally right in the middle. So if if your if your oil level is right there in the dead middle, that's bang on, and they want that to be checked hot, and they want it to checked uh, with the bike vertical. That's what's going on there. As far as changing the oil, you have three places where oil will come out, and one where it should not. I have seen where guys will take the A item out. The A is the spring and ball oil pressure regulator. If you remove that, you've not ruined your bike, but you've got a hassle. So you're going to have to make sure, and you can tip your bike over on the side and then reinstall the ball and the spring and then make sure that this is all reassembled correctly. So it's not the end of the world if you take out the A, but that's not how you change the oil. 
oil comes out of three places. It comes out of this drain plug here. And, and this is the only thing that is truly called the drain plug. The other ones are, are screens. Oil will come out of them. But this is what the book calls the, the drain. There's a magnet on there. Some small, very small, very minute metal particles and black debris, dirt that sort of accumulates onto this is normal. Um, if you have anything bigger on there, let me know. You can send me a, a, a picture of that and I can let you know if that seems normal or dangerous or not. But some small metal on that will be normal. This plug on the left-hand side is where you drain the oil. So that's the true drain, okay? Make sure that you get the crush washer back on that. Don't run your bike unless you have a crush washer and change that washer occasionally. We've got washer kits. It's not a big deal and they're not expensive, but you should be changing that occasionally. Also, don't put 600 foot pounds of torque on these things. I don't use a torque wrench, but I tighten them lightly. I um, I always tell guys, get your, get your like six year old son out. Imagine your six year old son is putting all of his effort into this. And I hope I'm not suggesting that you've got a, a the big bruiser six-year-old kid just an average little five six-year-old kid and you say hey put that bolt on with you know with your strength that's how tight that should be the bottom one here this is the transmission um filter so the the, tr the tranny has its own oil pump the engine has an oil pump there's two oil pumps on your bike each has a debris screen the one in the bottom is the tranny screen not the transvestite screen, the transmission screen. And that screen, when you pull that out, you can just blow that out with compressed air. You can also clean it with contact cleaner or carb spray. That's fine too. Blow it out. I, I don't. I'm lazy probably, or I don't want to spend extra money on a bunch of carb spray. So I just sh blow this out with compressed air from the inside and the debris will blow out on the outside. It traps debris on the outside. The inside is where the clean oil. So the dirty oil is brought drawn in through here, and the clean oil is, is, is sent to the bike through there. I blow that out. On the engine, so that's on the bottom. On the side, right in front of the drain plug, you have another screen, and it's the long screen. This is the engine oil pickup screen. And what the book will tell you is that once you take the cap off and you remove the screen and clean it, when you reinstall the screen, Put it into the engine first, then put the cap on second. Don't install that screen into the cap and then slide the cap screen in there. It, it can, and they show you this little diagram here by way of saying there is an alignment to that. So you could get it high. The screen could come in at an angle that was either high or low, and you'll have problems. And if you don't realize you've got that alignment wrong and you start threading this, this in, it'll just collapse and compress this screen here. So the correct way to do that is first put in the screen and then I take a flashlight and I just look in there and make sure that the alignment is good. And, and it'll either sit in there all the way or it won't. So it's somewhat obvious. Then put on your, your cap and do that last. Um... Everything else, as far as oil change, is standard to any motorcycle. Again, lots of stuff that's typical. Okay, so we're kind of here to the back of the book and sort of done with this. Now, um, this is something that I like to point out. If your engine will not crank, they don't tell you... Well, I guess they do. They tell you the main fuse is blown, and we talked about that. But they don't tell you to check the battery chassis ground. Almost any electrical related problem that your bike is having I always tell guys check the chassis ground so we've covered that and then if you go through engine cranks but won't start they give you you know fuse one and four those have to do with fuel pump and um, coil and so on so you're going to check those fuses and they also want you again we talked about idle speed but also I need to know what your fuel pressure is so if you call me and you explain that your bike won't start or it has some weird drivability characteristics Essential data is fuel pressure. Again, 48 through 51. They don't tell you that here in the troubleshooting chart, and, and I'm telling you that. Um, okay, so valve clearance. We talked about valves. Here's your data as far as that goes. Um, spark plug. Now, a lot of guys change their spark plugs. A lot of guys 
are too old school in their thinking about spark plugs. Your modern engine has an Iridium spark plug in it um, that lasts, that is rated to 100,000 miles. Think about this. My Honda Accord, it, it, it has a 100,000 mile spark plug in it, and my bike has the same plug. It's not the exact same part number, but it's the same um, makeup and characteristics, and yet a lot of guys are changing them to, too much. I don't necessarily have a recommendation for oil for, for the spark plug. I'll tell you this, whenever I do a top end, I replace the plug. And so I've got bikes that go five, six, seven hundred miles on the same spark plug as far as a top end. I will replace it with a top end. So if you feel comfortable and sleep at night and need to replace your spark plug like you would in your VW bug and you would change that spark plug every 15,000 miles, and that was a complete, that was grandpa's spark plug. And if you think that you need to do that and want to do that on your motorcycle, I have no problem. We'll sell you a spark plug all day long, put it in. But it should last, a spark plug should last a top end. Okay, um, the clicker data is here in the back. They've just condensed it. The other section of the manual has the same data, but here it is just kind of on one chart. And here's for the shock. And then we talked about engine oil. They want you to use a Jasso MA2 oil, like a true proper Jasso oil. They recommend, of course, MotorX products. All of these things are recommended as MotorX, which is fine. That's the in-house brand. And as far as coolant, so questions, uh, come up all the time about coolant you would want to use a silicate free coolant in your bike you can mix another silicate free coolant in your bike do your research figure out what that is uh, the, there's two different coolant bases maybe we need to do a video that's what we need to do we'll do a myth butter myth myth busters video on coolant cooling systems look for that later do your research find out what that means and then lastly, I think the last thing we'll talk about is gas. So we have got a high compression uh, piston. I think the 20s, the 520s, I think it's 11, it's 11.3 to 1 on the compression ratio for the new engines. And you need to run 91. I've had guys with drivability problems and they have not been running 91 or they're running sour gas. These bikes, they do not like sour gas and they do not like anything less than 91. You, you need to make sure that you're running that. And if you run your bike down in Mexico or you take an around the world trip or you go somewhere with these 20 bikes with the high compression, and this goes to any high compression motor, then you need to figure out what to do to get some octane. And so you'll have to carry some octane boost with you. Um, you'll have to figure that out on your own, but it's, it's super essential that you run correct octane on these bikes. So that's it, fellas. This has uh, been the complete top-to-bottom rundown on the service manual for your new 2020 EXE, FE, XC, FW, FES bikes. The FES, just to clarify the, the off-road bikes, tiny, tiny differences, but I'd say 99% exactly the same. If you have any questions or comments or you want to um, discuss further anything that we've talked about, you can... Call us here or leave your comments in the field. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. Uh, go out and get some adventure.